In Psalms, the second chapter, the Lord lays out, I believe, something that uh, is a principle that takes place in this world simply because there are two forces contending against one another. It says the kings of the earth or the rulers of the earth have set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed saying, let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords. But he that sitteth in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord shall have them in derision. When you think about it for a minute, all the powers of this world could align themselves against just a handful of people if that's all that was God's church on earth. And they would have no power because our God is the creator of the universe. And the object on this earth that he loves the most is that little group that accept him and obey his commandments. Now, in the book of Revelation, chapter 11, this is the focus that Jesus gives John. And he points out to John the major powers that are going to try to destroy God's church. But the book of Revelation gives us a clear view of the fact that God's church is going to triumph in the end. Let's look into Revelation chapter 11 together. John says, There was given me a reed like unto a rod, and the angel stood saying, Rise and measure the temple of God. Now, the word for temple is a Greek word, naos. It means the dwelling place of God and the altar and them that worship therein. It's referring to God's church on this earth, the place where he dwells. Now, God's church is not the great cathedral. God's church is not the various denominations. God's church is where two or three are gathered together in his name. He says, there's where I will be. There's where I will dwell. Because only the Holy One that inhabiteth eternity can constitute a church on earth. So this is the focus of John in this chapter in the book of Revelation. He is to measure or look to God's church. But the court, which is without the temple, leave out and measure it not, for it is given unto the Gentiles and the holy city shall they tread underfoot forty and two months. Let me try to unravel something of the, the symbolism here. A magnificent angel or a messenger from God from heaven gives him a reed like a rod, a symbol of judgment. But his focus is to be God's true people on earth, those who his spirit really does dwell in. But the court is to be left out of this judgment. The reason is, is the court represents the things that happen in this world. Remember our study of the sanctuary? Jesus came into this world. This world is where he died. And that was symbolized in the Hebrew system by the courtyard of the sanctuary. So in this, John is to realize that God's church is the object of attention of God. But the courtyard is to be left out of God's attention. And we see that the courtyard is the rest of the world. And God's people during the time period brought to view in this chapter were under terrible persecution. Now, does that make any sense that God's people should suffer in that way if God's regarding them and looking to them? But people met terrible, terrible persecution under the movement of the pagans, but worse persecution under a power that is to come. In the judgment that we're in right now, the names that are coming up in judgment are those who claim Christ as their Savior. Their hearts are being looked into to see if their claim is real. Now let's go on. It says, verse 2 again, leave the court out or leave uh, this world, those who have the spirit of this world in them, leave them out. They're outside of my temple or my church. Don't measure them. For it, referring to this world, is given into the hands of the nations. That's what the word Gentiles means. And the holy city, or God's people, shall they tread underfoot forty and two months. Of course, God is giving his church special regard at this time because they're going to suffer in a terrible way during this time period. Now, how long is forty and two months? Well, forty and two months is 1260 days. And as we studied the other night, is a, a day is a year in prophecy. So God's people will be trodden underfoot. His truths will be trodden underfoot for 1260 days. A day is a year, 1260 years. The area of focus at the time of John would have been the Roman Empire. Another power was to rise after the Roman Empire, and Paul tells us about that in 2 Thessalonians 2, verses 3 and 4. 
there shall come a falling away or the church would apostatize that and that the man of sin be revealed the son of perdition who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called call God some power would rise in the Christian church and the church itself would become a power of sin the power of man of sin now let's look at the time of Constantine he exalted the Bishop of Rome to power within 80 years after Constantine time the church the state church of Rome began persecuting so we had one Christian faction in the world in Rome that was claiming authority that did not belong to it it received this authority in full power at the time of Justinian and the Pope grabbing the scepter of the Caesars in 538 began a reign of terror in the European world it claimed authority over kings and over queens and claimed to be able to set up kings and to take them down Jesus said my kingdom is not of this world but the spires went up all over Europe and the iron hand of the Roman state religion came down guess how long that Roman state religion persecuted and was under the control of Europe well that history extends to the period of the French Revolution when the Pope was put in exile by the general Berthier of Napoleon's army that went into Rome he was brought back to France and there he died and the papacy never again gained the power it had exactly 1260 years it's the only power that can fulfill this prophecy so what happened to God's people during that time the state religion of Rome outlawed the Bible and a man could be put to death for reading the Bible it was to be locked away in the Latin language it was to be put away in obscurity and often the true church of God when it was seen it was seen as a man draped in in garments uh, with uh, devils written all over it and a cap on his head with de devils being burned at the stake and so the church of God was being trampled underfoot the truths of God many of them escaped into the mountain these are some of the homes of some of these early Christians that wanted to believe their Bible and went into the mountains to protect themselves from persecution many still live their descendants of these early Christians in verse 3 it says I will give power to my two witnesses and they shall prophesy or speak under inspiration or preach a thousand two hundred and three score days clothed in sackcloth now here you have that period of time again twelve hundred and sixty years in prophecy so for twelve hundred and sixty years even though God's precious church his temple his truths would be trodden underfoot by a Gentile power it would continue to witness I'll tell you nothing can stop the church of God on earth it is more powerful than persecution and that's what this history is about and he goes on to say these are the two olive trees these are the two candlesticks that stand before the God of the earth and if any man will hurt them fire proceedeth out of their mouth well, let's look into this symbolism in Revelation chapter 1 John saw Jesus standing in the midst of candlesticks this meant that Christ is dwelling in the hearts of his people on this earth in the hearts of his witnesses here in this world if we go to Revelation chapter 4 we read in verse 5 and out of the throne of God proceeded lightnings and thunderings and voices and there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne which are the seven spirits of God so here the lamps represent God's spirit it represents a dwelling of Christ among his people and then in Zechariah chapter 4 Zechariah is given a vision and in the vision and starting in verse 2 he said and said unto me what seest thou and I said I looked and behold a candlestick of gold with a bowl upon the top of it and his seven lamps thereon and seven pipes to the seven lamps which are upon the top and two olive trees by it one upon the right side of the bowl and the other upon the left side this is exactly the symbolism that John's talking about in Revelation chapter 11 and I'll drop down to five and the angel that talked with me answered or asked that's what it means and said unto me knowest thou what these be and I said no my Lord then he answered and he spake unto me he said now the the candlesticks and the olive trees this is what they are this is the word of the Lord unto Zerubbabel saying not by might nor by power but by my spirit saith the Lord so Jesus dwells in the hearts of his 
people through his word. And the spirit flows through that word into our hearts and gives us the power to witness. And when we look at this uh, beautiful symbolism of Zachariah's dream, uh, we see the olive trees representing the very the source that God sends his spirit into our hearts, that candlestick there. And this represents the work of God's word upon the heart of man. Now, in the Old Testament, these old prophets gave a prophecy of the coming of Christ. And the Old Testament is called the old witness. That's what the word testament means. It means witness. The New Testament was a description of the coming of Christ and of his second coming. It was the second witness or the new witness. So you had two witnesses, the Old and the New Testament. Do you know what this thing is? I know it looks like a piece of lettuce. But in fact, that is a Bible from the Middle Ages. Oh, the church would have liked to destroy the people that studied that word. But that Bible, you can tell, is well-worn. Many minds were blessed by the Spirit of God through his word, even though it had to continue to witness in sackcloth, which is a symbol of obscurity and death. Most of the Bibles within the Roman church at that time were were written in Latin so the people couldn't understand them. And then they were locked behind bo doors like this in the dungeons of churches so only the priests could ever have access to them. In this way, the people were, were blind. And yet, in other countries, the Bible was written out in different languages, in Syrian and uh, other languages, Chinese and other languages, and it continued to go, except in Europe where it was being persecuted. Many of the folks that accepted the word of God were willing to give up everything and anything just to have that precious word kept with them. And they suffered terrible deaths. Many times the people only saw the true church by watching someone being put to death in public places claiming that they were a heretic. And so you can see the prophecy of uh, John in Revelation chapter 11 met an absolute and perfect fulfillment during the 1260 years of the state religion's control of Europe as the Bible continued to witness in obscurity and seclusion. In verse 14 of Jeremiah chapter 5, we read, Wherefore, thus saith the Lord God of hosts, because ye speak this word, Behold, I will make my words in thy mouth fire, and this people would, and it shall devour them. The word of God spoken from the heart of a sincere Christian filled with the spirit of God becomes a means of bringing others to account. God will judge you on the basis of how much of this word you know. And so that word is symbolized as fire, a symbol of judgment at the end of time. In verse 6 of Revelation 11, again, the symbolism about the word of God goes on. It says, These have power to shut heaven, that it rain not in the days of their prophecy, and have power over waters to turn them to blood, to smite the earth with all plagues as often as they will. What's this? You mean the word of God has such power? Remember, the word of God created the universe. And by the word of God, the plagues will take place at the end of time. And men and women will be judged by that word. When Elijah speaking for God, announced the death of Jezebel, she was doomed. And she died in exactly the way it was pronounced. That Bible describes, at the end of time, ten or, or seven last plagues. And believe me, those plagues will happen. God's word has said it. And we will be brought to account by what we know about that word. In the judgment, each man will be measured on the basis of how much light God has given him. You'll be judged on the basis of your conscience and your knowledge of the truth. So that word is an extremely important thing to each one of us, to know it and to obey it. <clears throat> now let's go back to the narrative in Revelation chapter 11. Every aspect of this prophecy has met an exact fulfillment historically. Verse 7, and when they shall have finished their testimony. Now the Greek wording on this says it a little bit different. It says it this way, when they are finishing their testimony, the beast that ascendeth out of the bottomless pit shall make war against them and shall overcome them and shall kill them, and their dead bodies shall lie in the street of the great city, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. Now let's unravel this a little bit. First of all, the bottomless pit is an interesting place. It's an empty place, a place where there is no power, but it's a world of deception. In fact, in Revelation chapter 9, it actually names the ruler of the bottomless pit. It says that his name is Apollyon and Abaddon, two words, and those words means the destroyer and the exterminator. 
And yet the bottomless pit is a symbol of those religions that do not have a belief in Jehovah. Now, this beast always, a beast always symbolizes some political, religious organization or power. Sometime then, before the time that the Pope would be put in exile, 1798, sometime before that time, some new satanic power would arise to make war upon the word of God. And what the Roman church could not do during her 1260 years, this power does. It says it makes war on them and it kills them. But their, and their dead bodies will lie in a place in the street of a city, which is spiritually called Sodom and Egypt. And it says where also our Lord was crucified. So that brings three names to view. That brings to view Jerusalem where our Lord was crucified. And it brings to view Sodom and Egypt. Now, it's not out of harmony in the Bible for the Lord to use the name of some city to represent a spiritual condition. And so when you look at ancient Babylon, that was a wicked city, a terrible wicked city that tried to dominate the consciences and the minds of man. In Revelation chapter 17, God calls the apostate church at the end of time, which is combining its power with politics, it calls it Babylon. Because the spiritual condition of Christianity at the end will be like the early city of Babylon. So when we go to the city of Sodom, we see that the sins of Sodom, the Bible says, was pride, fullness of bread, abundance of idleness. They were haughty, and they would not help the poor and the needy, and they were licentious. They were caught up in sexual sins and immorality and uh, sodomy or, um, or homosexuality. This represents a spiritual condition of some place before 1798 in the Roman world or the European world. And then if we, we look on to Egypt, what were the sins of Egypt? What spiritual thing is God saying about Egypt? Do you realize that when Moses came before Pharaoh, it was the first king of the ancient world to totally reject and deny a belief in Jehovah? He chose to cling to his occult esoteric teachings of the forces in nature and himself as a medium for those fortunes. The mind sciences are what these pharaohs worship. And this condition, these beliefs were to spread sometime in some part of Europe before the end of 1798. The rejection of God, the abominable sins of sodomy and licentiousness. And then where our Lord was crucified, there would be in this locality a hatred for Christ. An absolute hatred. Do you know what happened at the cross in Jerusalem? Demons in the form of men and demons filling men's hearts with hatred towards Christ raised the cry of crucify him, crucify him that brought Jesus to the cross. That same attitude and feeling would be found someplace in Europe, in the Roman world, just before 1798. Now let's go to Europe. <clears throat> we find that in the heart of Europe, the country that had the highest amount of education, one of the wealthiest countries the world had ever known, where men sent their young people to learn the language of France, was there in, around Paris, magnificent area of the world. Now, early on, around 507, 508, a King Clovis formed a union with the Roman Catholic Church, and he became the first great champion of that power. Following in his steps eventually was Justinian who conquered both the East and Western Roman world and set the Pope up on his throne in Rome. But the things that were taking place in France just before 1798 is, is something that profoundly fulfills this prophecy. Just before 1798, there was violent revolution breaking out all over France. In fact, that revolution spread from France to Spain. It spread into Eastern Europe. It spread to Ireland. This warfare, this violence in France was taking place simultaneously throughout much of the old Roman world. What was happening in France? Why was this going on? Well, let's go to France at that time, shortly before 1798, and we learn <clears throat> that masonry from the early 18th century had spread its way down into France. There was some secret power that was working to bring about a violent revolution to destroy all churches and destroy all governments. 
Now, I'm going to go into that in a minute, but I want you to know that very early in the century before, the Roman church ruled France with an awesome power. For a while, they allowed the Huguenots or the Protestant Christians to have religious freedom, but a plan was hatched. And in 1572, one of the most horrible massacres that has ever taken place took place in France. Thousands upon thousands of people, some estimate 60,000 people were slaughtered that night. 20,000 in Paris alone. And the slaughter went on of these Huguenots. And it was a terrible thing, but see, some of the most intelligent and intellectual families of Europe were Protestants at that time. Many of them were the leading industrials. They had the knowledge of textile trade and these type of things. They ran many of the business. Many of them were middle class. When these people left, and some of the monarchy left at that time under this terrible persecution, why, it left France absolutely bankrupt. But it did one thing for France. According to the Roman Church, it did a wonderful thing for France. It left them totally in the hands of the Roman papacy. And a special order in the church is a Jesuit order. It was in control of the colleges and the schools, and it was also the confessors of the kings and the rulers in that country. And these Jesuits ruled the people with an iron hand. These people grew to hate Christianity. And since Protestantism had gone, since the Bibles were not allowed to the people, what eventually happened was a tremendous rift took place in the hearts of the people and the belief in Christianity entirely because they, they never knew a loving Christ. They only knew the iron hand of the Roman papacy. The ruling classes numbered about 150,000 people. These people dominated and controlled almost all the land, almost all the commerce, and most of the people were in almost a slave kind of bondage to them. At least they had food, and at least they had work, and many of these monarchies were concerned about the social development of the people. But among the monarchical families was a lot of, of, uh, of uh, immorality, and they would live for their own selves. They were proud. They were lazy. They had plenty of food, and they just didn't seem to be concerned enough about the common people. The people weren't even allowed to go into the forests and hunt because it was supposed to be the domain of these people. And when you look at Versailles, when you look at the palaces of Versailles where these people live, you can understand why a mother trying to nurse her child, her milk drying up and the child starving to death, could look at the palaces of these people and grow to hate them. In the Masonic lodges of Europe at that time, there was a movement to take advantage of the, the great anger that was taking place between the common people and these people who ruled. In the communes, in the poor areas of the city, there were leaflets and teachings passed around encouraging the people to a revolution, a revolution to take over the government and rule it themselves. But there was something behind that movement, and much of it was taking place in the Masonic circles even among the business or the, uh, the middle class. Men like Voltaire, men like Rousseau, and Robespierre were being financed by a secret and august body in Europe who desired a revolution to destroy France and a simultaneous revolution to destroy the world. There were 2,000 of these paid philosophers, and they were paid very well. They toyed with ideologies as a child would toy with, with a toy that he had been given. These men never believed their own ideologies. They never did. They were being used to foment anger, hatred, and revolution. And poor Louis XVI, he didn't fully understand the deep animosity and the plans that were laid because he was also part of this effort to improve the social conditions of the people. The poor man himself lost his life in the revolution. Now, the focal point of this revolution was the Bastille. It was hated by the people. It represented the iron control of both the church and the monarchy. When, in 1789, the plans had been carefully laid out and the order came down for the revolution to begin, the people donned the garb of the revolution and the Bastille was the first place that they stormed. They stormed the, the uh, barricades, they freed the people from the Bastille, they gave these people guns, and then they set up the terrible engine of the guillotine. Many of the ruling families met their fate and lost their heads. One after another were pulled from their, their homes, and their men, women, and children faced a terrible death. Even Louis XVI, once he realized that the revolution that he even helped to plot, 
He realized that there were other forces behind it and it was out of control. And there was nothing that he could do to win back his country. He tried to flee, flee but he and Marie Antoinette were captured, brought to the, the dungeons there, and eventually both of them lost their heads. You see, the goal of the group behind this revolution, these men who, who hated the true God, who worshipped Lucifer, they were nihilists and anarchists, and their ultimate goal was to reduce that country to to one-third of its original population. And the work of slaughter went out in terrible ways. When they couldn't do it in other ways, when the guillotine's blade became too hot and it began to warp, then they took people by the, by the boatloads and they sent them out into the middle of the river and they blew up those barges and the people sunk. And at times, there were literally thousands of mangled bodies along the side of the river and the stench could be smelt as the winds blowed, blew across France. Yes, this tremendous and wonderful French Revolution that so many people talk about today as they say liberty and fraternity and equality was one of the biggest mistakes that man has ever made in the history of this world. And friends, that revolution is continuing to take place. At the height of the revolution, 1793, by that time they had killed many of the priests, they had outlawed the Bible, uh, the people were... were were just giving up all the laws of morality and women were being just cat, uh, passed around like cattle. It was a terrible time. The system was deteriorating so fast under the reign of terror. But at the height, 1793, the great feasts of reasons were carried on. In these feasts, they burned Bibles. And they would t take a cross, which they believed was a symbol of Christ at that time, tie it to the tail of a donkey. And then they would lead a donkey through the streets as the people laughed and made merry and cried out, crush the wretch, crush the wretch, referring to Jesus Christ. You see, this place was to have the same spirit as Jerusalem. And then they would take the communion cup, which these people recognized as Christianity then, even though they don't realize, uh, we realize more clearly today, but they'd hold the communion cup and they would have the jackass drink out of the communion. And they would laugh Jesus Christ to scorn just as they had done, the Jewish people had done many, many years before. And <clears throat> they would take a dance hall girl and put her on a great big float. You could see a statue of a dance girl there. And they would honor her and bow down before her and exalt her as the new God, the goddess of reason. And publicly, that national assembly, the assembly of France, denounced God and passed a, a uh, resolution that God did not exist and there's your religion of Pharaoh, the rejection of Jehovah, the licentiousness of Sodom, the rejection of Jehovah, and the hatred for Jesus Christ were perfectly fulfilled in the French Revolution just before 1798. The priests of the Roman Church, many of them had entered masonry at that time. Some of the higher orders of masonry in France had been organized by the Jesuits. The Jesuits were largely behind this revolution, and that's documented fact. And many of these priests converted to a new Catholicized atheism in France. And this is why even today liberal theology largely stems from the French Revolution. Those priests who would not convert to the system, friends, those priests were put to death on the very streets that they had encouraged people to put the Protestants to death uh, a century before. In verse 10 of chapter 11 it goes on to say, and they that dwell upon the earth shall rejoice over them and make merry and shall send gifts one to another because these two prophets tormented them and that dwelt upon the earth. And after three days and a half, the spirit of life from God entered into them and stood upon their feet and great fear fell upon them which saw them. Them is referring to the Old and New Testament, the word of God, the two witnesses. The world or, or France would rejoice that they had put to death the Word of God. You see, they burned every Bible that they could get a hold of, shut down the printing presses, and outlawed it. And they continued their celebrating on uh, for several years after this. But the prophecy is that in three days, or three and a half days, that God's Spirit would enter in again into His Word, and His Word would become a witness, and terror would fall upon these people. Well, the Feast of Reasons continued. The people continued to celebrate the rejection of God's law and His Word. But what happened to fulfill the prophecy that in three and a half years it would come up again? Well, France wanted to send its revolution out to the other countries. That was its goal. 
It has sent out th four great armies. One was headed by a young man named Napoleon. Three of the armies were destroyed, but Napoleon's army conquered and continued to conquer. He said and he claimed that he could go through 30,000 men a month, and he did. Tremendous destruction of human life that this man used in trying to spread revolution to the world. But France, because of the rejection of God's word, was falling to pieces, and all these little atheistical factions, these little socialist groups, each with their own uh, belief in how the revolution should be won, began to fight against one another. The assembly was falling apart. The leaders of the government appealed to Napoleon to come back. And here, these men and this country, which tried to set up a government of the people through revolution, were now pleading for a dictator to bring peace back to their country. Well, Napoleon was just that kind of hero that the people looked up to. And when he came in, he set up an absolute dictator. And he sent a, his general Berthier into Rome and put the Pope in exile, brought him back to France, and he died in jail there. And then he set his own puppet bishop up in France. He was going to be the ruler of a new Holy Roman Empire with himself as the chief ruler of that system. And then it says that in the same... I'm going to skip these two. I can't read every quote in this, or we'll never get through it tonight. This revolution, though, was not to end. In verse 18 of Revelation chapter 11, it says, The nations were angry, thy wrath has come, the time of the dead that they should be judged, and that thou shouldest give reward unto thy servants, the prophets, and to the saints, and them that fear thy name, small and great, and shouldest destroy them which destroy the earth. This French Revolution will continue right on to the end of time, till a time of judgment, until a time the earth is destroyed. And these people that started destruction in France are going to try to destroy this whole world. But notice the time period that they will try to do that in. Revelation chapter 11, verse 19, John saw in vision that this tremendous revolution lasting to the end of time, he says, and the temple of God was opened in heaven and there was seen in his temple the ark of the testament. The testament is the Ten Commandments given on Sinai. That's what it was called in the old Hebrew text. The ark of the testament. And there were lightnings and voices and thunderings and an earthquake and great hail. And that describes the end of time after the judgment. You see, that revolution is to take place at the time that Jesus enters the most holy place in heaven and is doing that judgment just before he comes. Friends, that revolution is even beginning to, to start to reach a climax today. And I want to go into the history of this thing a little bit. But I want you to know that Jesus right now is ministering, and as he's ministering, Satan is mustering his last forces to destroy God's church in this world. And so when we turn to Revelation 17, a description of the last forces to come into play at the end of time, we see this amazing thing. It says, the beast that thou sawest was and is not. And this is talking about a, another beast that's to arise at the end of time, another great political religious system that's going to try to crush the truth in this world. And it says that this system will ascend out of the bottomless pit. The same source as the beast from the French Revolution. You see, the same teachings of occult esotericism that led to the French Revolution are going to involve the whole world in a destruction far more terrible than what took place in France. The Bible prophecies always, always work out perfectly. And I believe you'll see that this one is even taking place before our very eyes. Now, let's go back to France and let's trace the movement of this world revolution and conspiracy right up into the time that we live in today. Now, I'm not going to read every quotation. This program is meant to be a weekend seminar. And so we're going to go very fast through it. And you're just going to get an overview. Just skim this, the surface of this tremendous subject. This symbol was designed by Adam Weishaupt, a Jesuit priest and a Jew. Adam Weishaupt used this as a symbol of his organization called the Illuminati, or the Illuminated Ones, a word that comes from the name Lucifer. These were Lucifer worshipers. Annuit Queptus, our enterprise, Novus Order Seclorum, a new world order. It became a Masonic symbol in 1782 at the Congress of Wilhelmsbad. The significance of the design on that symbol, it's on the American dollar bill, by the way, the pyramid represents the conspiracy for the destruction of the universal or the Catholic Church and the establishment of a one-world UN dictatorship. 
The secret of the order, the eye radiating in all directions, is the all-spying eye that symbolizes the terroristic Gestapo-like espionage agency that Wa Adam Weishaupt set up under the name of the insinuating brethren to guard the secret of the order and to terrorize the people into the acceptance of its rule. This Ogpu had its first workout in the reign of terror of the French Revolution. So that thing that's on our dollar bill shows that something is still in operation that began in the French Revolution. In the Christian history book, Great Controversy, it pinpoints who this beast is that ascends out of the bottomless pit, this satanic power that it rose to crush the word of God. It says, The beast that ascendeth out of the bottomless pit shall make war against them, or the word of God, and shall overcome them and kill them. And then this author goes on to say, The atheistical power that ruled in France during the French Revolution and the reign of terror did wage such a war against God and his holy word. So there's the answer to that prophecy. Now, what was the secret power that was in an effort to destroy the Christian Bible? Well, you're going to have to go back to Jerusalem again. And I mentioned before that demons were taking possession of the bodies of men, driving them to destroy Christ. The leaders of that movement were the Jewish leaders. These men became possessed by the powers of darkness. Their goal was to destroy Christ and every vestige of Christianity in this world. Their goal is to set up their own system of religion as a, a religion that would control all the religions and uh, governments of the world. We know that in ancient Babylon that many of these Jewish leaders adopted the Babylonian religion of astrology. And we find that although this is not the true Hebrew religion, those who are in power behind this movement believe it and they are working it out. And they're working it out financially, friends. The world is coming into bondage financially. Uh, the man who was one of the foremost in this movement was a man named Anschald Meyer. He established a bank in Frankfurt, Germany. He put, hung out of his establishment, his little bank, a, a big red shield, and he called himself Rolt Child or Red Shield in German. And so his name was, event, they were eventually given uh, a, a title, a nobility, by the rulers of the Austro Hungarian Empire for the financial work they had done for them. And they were given the name Rothschild. And that, that Jewish family has held that name ever since. He had four sons. Each one of these sons was sent to a different country of Europe. One was even sent to England. They established the banking family there, and they financed each branch of the revolution as it spread from country to country. They didn't believe in the ideologies of these revolutions, but they knew that it would destroy those countries. They financed it, and those countries were placed in hawk to them, and they just simply took over the central banking system of each one of those countries. And they, in this way, they controlled the destiny of Europe and the world. They had control, believe me, they had a lot of power, but they needed a plan, a plan that would secretly infiltrate the monarchies and religions and bring them all to rubble. This is to be found in Bavaria, at a prestigious Jesuit university there in Ingolstadt, a man named Adam Weishaupt, a doctor of canon law of the church. Just a few years before, uh, 1776, three years before, the Jesuits had to dissolve their order, and many of them secularized themselves. But with the destruction of that order, a tremendous power had to go underground. Adam Weishaupt was a genius, no doubt about it. At 21, he was a doctor of canon law, and he wrote out a plan that was published finally in 1776, May 1. Now you know why the communist world acknowledges that day as the workman's day throughout the world. Adam Weishaupt wrote his, his, his teachings out for a secret society that destroyed the government. Now, John Robeson, a mason from England, a high-ranking mason, he was a brilliant man, he was brought into this order and went along with it to find out what was going on in these secret circles. It absolutely shocked him. He got to know Adam Weishaupt. He even published in 1798 or 1789, he published the teachings of Weishaupt who were planning the French Revolution, but the governments of Europe would not pay attention to it. Why, it sounded too ridiculous. And people are still saying that today while the earth is crumbling around them. And it's very unfortunate. By this plan, says Weishaupt, we shall direct all mankind. 
In this manner and by the simplest means, we shall set all in motion and in flames. The whole world was to be destroyed by the secret society. This was in 1777. Weishaupt had long been scheming the establishment of an association or order which in time should govern the world. 1789 was the sparking point for world revolution by this secret society. When we look at the French Revolution, we're going to have to see that there were powers and plans behind that that was to launch that all the way through the time that you and I live in today. You know where I took this picture? Well, you can see the German there on, the, uh, on that backdrop. I took this in East Berlin in a communist uh, museum there, and it was on the origins and the history of the communist revolution and one of the largest displays was on the French Revolution. You see the name communism comes from the French word for how the French lived in communes. It was from the French Revolution that communism got its name and its direction. Now a Adam Weishaupt continued to carry on the writings and the helm of this organization until his death in 1830. But by this time his secret society had spread and it had a tremendous influence, especially in Prussia. In time in Italy, a man came into it, another genius by the name of Mazzini, fascinated by Lucifer worship. He became enamored by the idea of revolution and became one of the leaders in this vast secret society. Research dug up letters from Mazzini which revealed how the high priest of the Luciferian creed keep their identity and true purpose secret. In a letter Mazzini wrote to his revolutionary associate, Dr. Bridenstein, only a few years before he died, he said, We form an association of brothers in all points of the globe. We wish to break every yoke, yet there is one unseen that can be hardly felt, yet it weighs on us. Where does it come from? Where is it? We, no one seems to know, or at least no one is telling us. This association is secret even to us, the veterans of the secret society. What association do you think that was? Friends, it was the Illuminati. And it was still in existence in the 1870s when he was writing this material. The man who was exalted to the highest position in Illuminism and Masonry at that time was a man named Albert Pike. In 1887 and 88, these men established what was called a Palladian Rite. They established three great world centers of Masonic control for international conspiracy and world revolution. One was in the United States, one was in Germany, and one was in Rome. Adam, uh, uh, Albert Pike spoke and wrote in, in 16 languages fluently. He was one of the, the, the most amazing geniuses the world had ever known, and yet he led out in magnificent seances where demons would manifest and float around in the air right out in public from a letter that he wrote to the Palladium, the Secret Society in 1889, Albert Pike said, that which we say to the crowd is that we worship God, but, and he's saying, but it is the God that one worships without superstition. You see, the God of human reason says the religion should be by all us initiates of the high degrees maintained in the purity of the Luciferian doctrine. That's the religion of the Illuminati. Yes, he says, Lucifer is God. And unfortunately, Adonai is God also, for the absolute can exist only as two gods. They believed in a balance between good and evil. But notice, Lucifer is their God, and Adonai, he says, is unfortunately God also. That's the name they give to Jesus Christ. Thus, the doctrine of Satanism, or Lucifer being Satan, is a heresy. And the true and pure philosophical religion is the belief in Lucifer, the equal of Adonai, but Lucifer, God of light and God of good, is struggling for humanity against Adonai, the God of darkness and evil. Friends, you're reading right there the teachings of the New Age today. They believe in Lucifer and they believe that, that, uh, that the Christ of the Christian is a ruler of the dark forces, or the dark side of the force. These teachings were in the secret societies for years, and now they're publicly presented before the world. Why is it public today? Because we're in the last parts of these people's revolutionary schemes. Look at this quotation from the same letter. It says, We shall unleash the nihilists and the atheists, and we shall provoke a formable social cataclysm, which in all its horror will show clearly to the nations 
the effect of absolute atheism, origin of savagery, and of the most bloody turmoil, then everywhere the citizens obliged to defend themselves against the world minority of revolutionaries, and I want to add here at that comma, that they will, they will finance and promote the revolutionaries just to create a, a headache for society, so society has to destroy them and pass laws that curb the freedom of the free men will exterminate those destroyers of civilization and the multitudes disillusioned with Christianity, anxious for an ideal but without knowing where to render adoration, will receive the true light through the universal manifestation of the pure doctrine of Lucifer finally out in public view, a manifestation which will result from the general reactionary movement which will follow the destruction of Christianity and atheism, both conquered and exterminated at the same time. They believe that the Luciferian religion or the Aquarian Age religion will take over the earth and at the time that's taking over the earth, they plan to destroy Christianity and atheism. In, again, this, this Christian writer, in a book that was written, Evangelism, she says this, the same author of Great uh, are, are the Cosmic Conflict, she says, a power from beneath is working to bring about the last great scenes in the drama. Satan coming as Christ and working with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in those who are binding themselves together in secret societies. This woman saw what was going on in those secret societies, even the plan of Lucifer coming, pretending to be the Christ at the end of time. Those who are yielding to the passion for confederation are working out the plans of the enemies. You hear the cry for brotherhood today. Let's join together in peace. This effort for brotherhood and confederacy is working out the plans of the enemy. The cause will be followed by the effect. There'll be a great French Revolution, but covering the whole world, friends. Terrible destruction. Now, one of these men who wrote for both communism and for Hitler was a man by the name of uh, Alice Cr uh, Alistair Crowley. Alistair Crowley became very popular in the 60s among many of the high school and college students, his books. He was a high-ranking Mason and Rosicrucian. He wrote out a law. In this law, it says man has the right to do anything that he wants to do. And look at number five. It says man has the right to kill those who would thwart these rights. The slaves shall serve. These men, I don't care how good the religion they're telling you is, they are only using that as a means to make a slave out of you. They believe they have that right, that authority. They believe in what's called the law of the jungle. They believe that's the natural law. These men have searched the world for a place to establish a great revolution. In the latter part of the 19th century, an organization called the Internationale was set up. It was a, a union of socialistic secret societies throughout Europe. They had meet in vast meetings. The majority of them were Jewish people working in behind this system to bring about revolution. Two men were called upon by Mazzini and Pike to lay out a plan that would be the foundation or the platform for world revolution. This was Marx and Engels. Karl Marx was a Jewish man, but I don't believe he believed in the true religion of the Jewish people. He was an atheist. And he hated the Hebrew God. He was a worshiper of the God Lucifer. In England, the same type of, of revolutionary plans were going on. Cecil Rhodes, who made his fortune in diamonds and gold in South Africa, left his entire fortune to Lord Rothschild, Jewish Rothschild in England, wanting it to be used to foment a world revolution and bind the whole world together under the dominion of a one-world government. So it was taking place in England at the same time. People in Europe and in America financed Lenin to go into the Soviet Union and to conquer that country, to become the first great platform or the first great center for this world revolution so they can continue from one location to spread it throughout the world. Remember we talked about 1844 as the turning point in history as Jesus entered into the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary to begin his final work for his church and his people? It was in that year, shortly after, in 1848, that Marx laid out his plan before his people. And in 1850, the Communist Manifesto was published. Since that time, that movement has been the fastest and the greatest growing movement that the world 
has ever seen. And people say, well, I don't see it in prophecy. Friends, if it affects God's church, it is profoundly revealed in prophecy. Lenin wrote out a plan, a master plan to take over the world. Now listen carefully to this. Put your thinking caps on with this. This was written in 19, this was in 1921. It was written out in 1917. Secure the Soviet Western borders through a takeover of the Baltic states, Poland and all Eastern European countries. Platform one, get Eastern Europe. Platform two, gain control of the Far East through subversive attacks in Korea, Vietnam, Indo Indonesia, and the Philippines. Platform two, take over the East. Gain control of Africa and the Mediterranean, the Indian Ocean, and all the waterways such as the Suez Canal. Take over the waterways. Gain control of the oil fields. Take over Africa. Platform three. And four, gradually subject all of Latin America into communist rule beginning in Cuba. Why Cuba? Because it was Lenin's plan. And then, verse, uh, number five, once Russia has exercised control of the world, take over the United States when she is outgunned and completely surrounded. Do you want to know what the, what the effort to get the Western world to disarm its nuclear weapons is all about, friends? It's the last part of the plan to take over the world by these revolutionaries. <clears throat> Every part of the plan worked like clockwork. The first thing they did is destroy the royal family. They moved into Asia, the second platform there, and we know that the, the result of it has been a terror that we can hardly imagine, far worse than anything, friends, that took place in Nazi Germany. 200 million people have lost their lives in the movement of this monster, this great red beast from the bottomless pit. We look in Cambodia and three to five million people in a country of seven to eight million people were ruthlessly slaughtered and destroyed there. One of the most horrible massacres in history took place just under our noses, just in the last decade. And people are turning their eyes and minds away. They still talk about the Holocaust when the Holocaust is still going on today. Now let's go back to this seal of Adam Weishaupt. Why is it on our dollar bill? Well, it says the reverse of the seal of the United States of America, according to Manley P. Hall, an expert on Masonic lore, not only were many of the founders of the U.S. government Masons, but they received aid from a secret and august body existing in Europe, which helped them to establish the United States for a peculiar and particular purpose known only to the initiated few. The great seal, says Hall, was a signature of this exalted body, and the unfinished pyramid on its reverse side is a trestle board setting forth symbolically the task to the accomplishment of which the U.S. government was dedicated from the day of its inception. What is he talking about? The fact is that right from the beginning in the United States, the Illuminati had infiltrated American masonry and the revolution that took place in this country to separate it from England was won, not by some little guy with a, with a little beanie on shooting a squirrel gun. That isn't what happened. The ones who came in and conquered the, the U.S. to give us our freedom or liberty, if you want to call it that, were French revolutionaries. The French army came in under Lafayette and fought the battle for us. Behind the government of the United States is a secret government. And early in its history, there were warnings in masonry against Illuminism taking over the United States. It was a tremendous movement. In time, Rothschild sent his financial stooges over to this country to establish uh, financial banking houses to finance the railroads, to finance the steel industries, and all of these uh, leading industrialists came to Rothschild for money to invest. In time, the Rockefeller family line, the one who went into the oil industry, became the dynasty to, to be worked through by the Illuminati for world revolution. They tried desperately to get control of our banking system, but it was not until President Wilson came into office. In 1913, the Federal Reserve Act was passed, and the U.S. banking system, the, the interest rates, the making of coins, all fell into the hands of these banks. They were, some of the leaders of some of these banks were Europeans. And somehow they were able to form this Federal Reserve System where it was all members of these internationalist banks. And they gained the financial destiny of the United States. And in that, friends, the financial destiny of the world. Colonel Mandel House was sent over from the Round Table Conspiracy in England 
to stand beside Wilson and to help him in establishing the Federal Reserve Act. He established in 1921 a group in the United States called the Council on Foreign Relations, which was the headquarters of Illuminism in the United States, the effort for one worldism, one world revolution. It's a tremendous organization today. It has an international invest, uh, intelligence gathering network that's, that's paralleled by very few. When Roosevelt came into office, he had been, um, his ancestors had been part of the Illuminati conspiracy, and it was very interesting to see him promote and have the reverse of the seal put on the dollar bill. Roosevelt, along with Stalin, and along with Churchill, met in Yalta after the Second World War. And you know what they did? They gave half of Europe to Stalin. Half of Europe was given to, to the atheistical power whose plan was to take over the world. Now, Chiang Kai-shek was dependent upon defense from the United States against the movements of communism. He was, he was a Christian. His wife was a Christian. They were establishing both Christian schools the educational system and their, their dairy, their agriculture were coming under the helm of Christian men that were being hired by the Chiang Kai-shek government. Roosevelt went over there and he reneged on an agreement between China and the United States for protection because he told Chiang Kai-shek, you've got to take your communists into your government. And he refused to do it. We withdrew our help and what happened? China, of course, fell into atheistic hands, and millions of people again lost their lives as this beast from the bottomless pit swept over them, and Napoleon and Abaddon, the destroyer, Lucifer himself, gained control over those masses. How many countries have been completely taken over by this monster? And before it's over, how many more will be completely taken over? Well, it has a powerful tool, and that tool is in the United States. It's called the United Nations. Stalin laid out an intermediary goal for the accomplishment of Lenin's goals. He said, number one, we're to confuse and disorient and destroy the forces of capitalism around the world, one. Number two, bring all the nations together into a single world system of economy. Friends, it's happening today. Force the advanced countries to pour prolonged financial aid into the under underdeveloped countries. Divide the world into regional groups as a transitional stage to total world government. Populations will more readily abandon their national loyalties to a vague regional loyalty. Eventually, he says, bring everybody into a single world dictatorship or, or into the United Nations, and you'll have the whole world in the dictatorship of the proletariat. We find that our secrets were taken, the secrets of atomic warfare were taken, and were, uh, after the Second World War, were given to the Soviet Union by the Rosenbergs, a Jewish couple. The result was the most terrible arms race in the history of man. You see, after the Second World War, there was a tremendous movement of the communists to move upon the hearts of American people to work for the downtrodden. Many of these people were sincere, but they looked to Soviet Union as the answer to all men's dilemmas, and they were totally confused like those people before the French Revolution. The United States is looked to as the hope for humanity, but the fact is that the United States is very much a part of this world revolutionary conspiracy and will never help. One of the most horrible things that I believe has ever taken place is men from Australia, from Britain, and the other countries of Europe and America fighting under the UN flag because a majority of the members of the UN are socialist in nature. Our country has opened its borders up. We have such a free policy. And because of it, we're flooded with Soviet agents and Soviet spies. The communist has a blueprint for the use of the United Nations. Number one, consolidate total working control of the United Nations into the communist hands as rapidly as possible. Number two, use the United Nations to break up the colonial territories of the non-communist countries. Hear about all these new little republics that are rising. Use the United Nations as a vehicle for subversive espionage and propaganda within the non-communist member nations. Then induce the non-communist member nations to abandon any strong independent foreign policy of their own by turning over this function to the United Nations. Maneuver the non-communist member nations into establishing socialism at home as a necessary transition stage to, the com to communism and to become dependent economically on the overall international socialist control and direction of the UN. 
and then induce the stronger non-communist member nations to transfer full control of their military forces to the United Nations. After this, no resistance is possible. The world will be communist. And every step of that is taking place today, right before our very eyes, but we're so ignorant. In the public school system, the children are being trained and taught that the UN is the only answer and hate the bomb and all of these things are part of this world conspiracy. But when you go and you see when they, um, when they uh, turned over China and when they gave the Soviet Union Eastern Europe, they began the motion of this revolution towards the end of time. We look in Africa, one little country after another has fallen in Africa. Thousands, millions have fallen to communist propaganda and communist control. Hundreds of thousands have died. And listen, much of it was done under the auspices of the UN. And it's interesting when, when we read, they say, we have tried so hard and we have failed so miserably. What have they failed at? They failed at bringing peace. But what they've tried hard to do is to break down the sovereignty of the great world nations to bring the whole world into a socialist camp. Hoover, the head of the uh, FBI in the United States, did tremendous research into the work that the communists were doing in the U.S. And he announced that the Negro situation is being exploited fully and continuously by the communists on a national scale. Why? He says the communists are deliberately maneuvering among the Negroes to create a situation for the outbreak of racial violence to such an extent that it can be turned into a civil war, a civil war on a racial basis. In such a civil war, should they succeed in fomenting it, the communists hope to so undermine the American government and our social structure that they can take it over. You see, in the 50s, they encouraged the, uh, the dark races in the United States to to pull together to revolt against the U.S. government and to form their own country in the South, which would be controlled from Russia, and they would make the black people in that new government the, the uh, honored citizens. And this encouraged these people who, who were still under a lot of racial pressure and tension. You see, they always work with a group that they feel that they could exploit and take advantage of. And, of course, the problem was already there, and they just did. Now, if you look at the far right side of this picture, you're going to see a man named Martin Luther King when he was a young man. This is a communist school, and he's studying how to aid in world revolution. He and other men rose about the same time in the early 60s to tremendous prominence as there was an effort on the part of the communists to raise this consciousness in the dark rages to stand up by themselves and to revolt against the system they were in. These were all called freedom rallies, but right on the wake of them were a lot of bloodshed and a lot of violence. Today, because in the inner cities there are so many of these folks on welfare, and there, it's just a time bomb in the U.S. for violence. They're hoarding automatic weapons there, and we don't know what is soon to happen. We don't know when the tide is going to break. These folks have been taken advantage of, and many of these people who speak out against what's taking place, many of them are victims of these groups themselves if they don't cooperate with them. Now watch for racial tension around the, around the earth. I know there's terrible racial tension taking place in New Zealand with the Maoris today. And uh, there's an effort, a land movement in Australia, and this is being controlled by the communists as well. In every part of the globe, they're trying to, to focus on racial hatred, and they're trying to raise up a violent revolution. Around the colleges and universities, they congregate like a bunch of vultures to take in the young minds of, of children that are going to the colleges and universities. The kids at that age think they're so smart. And then when they get this new material, they think they're smarter than their adults. And they're not willing to look at the results of history but they think they've got something new to run with. No, it's not new at all. It's an old plan for the destruction of the world. Even today, on May Day, there's always advertisements for, for men to stop working. One of the focal points of this revolution is Hollywood in the United States. Ever since the early years, the communists have worked strongly through the medium of, of movies and television and radio to breed immorality and hatred towards Christianity. Another main area of operation in this world revolution is the situation with petrol and gas. We know that wonderful inventions for alternate forms of power have been available, 
but not developed because they want to keep you dependent largely on overseas oil so they can manipulate your economy. Another area where the socialist communist revolution has worked very hard through is through the Vatican after it shifted to liberal theology beginning with John uh, the 23rd. The Vatican II movement was an effort to bring the world back together. They closed the door to the interests of the Western Protestant Christian world, and they opened their doors to the Soviet Union and to diplomats from the communist world. You see, way back in their history, quite a number of the early French socialists, atheists, were also members of the Roman Catholic Church in France. And this has become the birthplace of the new liberal theology that we see taking place today. This is uh, Carol Wotilla when he was a young boy. He was raised by a father, a Polish uh, military man. His mother died when he was young. And because he was devoted to his, uh, his religion, when his father died, he had nothing left. He devoted himself entirely to the cause of the Roman Catholic Church. He became a revolutionary against the regimes that came into power, first national, uh, Nazi Germany and then communism. But he is a socialist. There's no doubt about it at all. Have you ever seen him wear the tiara, the symbol of the position and power of the Pope? No. He dons himself more as a socialist leader, as a revolutionary leader. And this is him speaking before the United Nations. According to Murray Kempton of the New York Post, it says there were curious echoes of Karl Marx's arraignment of the 19th century capitalism in his speech before the UN. The Pope went far beyond the criticizing the materialism that, that permeates the American life. He aligned himself in spirit with the demands of the developing nations for restructuring world economic order. See, here's a tremendous political power that's working with other socialistic powers or communistic powers or a great red beast, and they're working together. Very symbolism found in Revelation chapter 17. Now here's another center for world revolution. This is the uh, World Council of Churches. And they are known to be a headquarters of communist activity. The National Council of Churches for years has been a hotbed of communist activity. Men tried to warn the United States. They tried to warn the governments of Europe of the danger of Adolf Hitler. And they wouldn't listen. And John Robeson tried desperately, publishing material, sending letters to the, the heads of the French government to warn them of this conspiracy and what was about to happen. But they wouldn't listen. The result was a destruction of France in the middle of the night, or the latter part of the uh, 18th century and then the middle of the 20th century, the terrible destruction of one of the most magnificent cultures that ever existed on the face of the earth. Friends, God is giving us a warning again right now today. He's laid this out in his word. We know that Jesus is finishing up his work in the heavenly sanctuary right now. And Satan is doing his best now, while he knows his last work is going on, to teach errors, to spread lies, to confuse people concerning to Christianity and as fast as he can possibly bring this communist revolution to an end to squelch the Christian church and the opportunities that people have for salvation. I know that Christ more than ever before is pleading for people to study carefully the teachings of Christianity, to take this word, the witnesses of God, and through this word allow that sacred oil of the Holy Spirit to flow into our hearts and fill us with the power of the Creator. And we have a responsibility to study this out. As those faithful people during the Dark Ages, during that 1260 years, maintain the truth even with the cost of their lives and their shed blood, God is going to have a church at the end of this Earth's history which will stand for the Bible and the Bible only in spite of the occult teachings going on in the world, and the teachings of atheism that are all around us that are gaining ground. Jesus' highest regard are those who commit themselves to him. In this last message, while the world is crumbling, uh, crumbling around us, is a message of hope. It's an invitation to come home, that the battle is just about over, and that Jesus is coming very, very soon. I want to extend that invitation to you tonight. I realize the subject tonight was rather heavy, but I believe it's important. I believe it's important that I can share to you the Christian perspective on what's happening in the New Age movement 
and communist revolution today. These things are exactly what happened in France, and they are leading the world to the last great test. I encourage you to study like you've never had before because we don't know how much time we have left. Come into Christ. Take hold of him and don't let him go. Don't take any chances with your soul. If there's anyone here that would like to accept Christ as their personal Savior tonight, I want to extend that, extend that invitation to you from him. And I'll be in the room over here. If anybody wants to give their life to him and receive him into their heart this evening, you can go out of here knowing that you have a Savior and that you have a future. Let's bow our heads, shall we? Dear Father in heaven, we thank you. Oh, we thank you so much for the gift of your Son. Such love we can't comprehend, O oh God. But we just look at it and we praise thee for it. And dear Lord in heaven, I just want to pray for each soul that's come here tonight. I pray that they may take a real look at the world around them and then a real look at Jesus. And I pray that not one of the souls that has come here tonight will be lost in that day when you make up your kingdom but they'll make a total and complete commitment to you. And I pray for the masses out there, Lord, who don't know the wonderful Lord Jesus Christ. I pray that some way that would give me and others here the strength to reach out to them before it's forever too late. These things I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Tomorrow night is, I believe, the most important program of the entire series. That's why it's right in the center of the whole series. The program deals with the greatest secret of the history of Christianity, and it's a profound secret. It'll change your life. And I, I want you to be here. It's a historical study of something that Christian history, secular history, has totally missed, and yet it's one of the most amazing histories that you could ever imagine has taken place. I beg you to please be here and bring a friend tomorrow night. Thank you so much for coming.